you probably know James Blunt from his 2004 hit, You're Beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. But James was 30 years old You're when that beautiful. song came out and had already lived a completely different life. It almost sounds unbelievable. I was living a life, seeing the world, and coming back with things to say. Before becoming a pop star, James served in the British Army in places like Kosovo, where he sometimes had to make really tough calls. What I really felt was that this is easy, but are there not consequences of killing 200 Russians? And after that, he served as one of Queen Elizabeth's royal guards while also pursuing music. I was getting up at six every morning, riding horses out, uh, marches with the Queen beside her in her carriage, and then at night I'd be going to do these small concerts. And after that, he randomly became roommates with the actor Carrie Fisher while recording his first album. I've got Elton John's junior manager as my manager. I've been signed by Linda Perry in the States, I'm, I'm, and I'm living with Carrie Fisher. You know, you think life is... Whatever dream it is, it's going to work. Today on the show, James reveals the inspiration behind his biggest hit. I sat in a bath, <laughs> having seen that girl on a, on a subway, and just wanted to just say, you're beautiful. Also, the backlash he endured for not being cool enough. Most people on this planet aren't cool. Most people are dealing with real life. He'll also talk about the cutthroat competition he had to face just to get his album heard. We're fighting for a record deal, and it's... It's to the death because it's our dream. So without further ado, here's my conversation with James Blunt. All right, well, we're going to talk, obviously, about you, your life, and with an emphasis and a focus on your creative process and how you think about your work. I, I, and particularly, there's an area that I want to touch on later on, which is um, there's a guy writing a bio biography about the relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And he just wrote an op-ed because this new song came out, you know, this old song that's been resurfaced yeah. now and then. And... Um, he basically writes that, you know, the relationship between these two men was a love affair, not obviously a physical love affair, but it was a, it was like it's like a marriage, you know, and um, and that they grew up at a time um, when men, certainly in Britain, couldn't talk about their feelings. It was not acceptable. Um, I think in the United States today, it's much more common for men to to do that than in Britain even now. You know, there's still it's changed a lot, but it's still a little different than Britain. In America, you know, we wear our heart on our sleeves um, for the most part. But what was cool about this article is it talked about how that the way they expressed emotions was in their was in their music. Yeah. Like that's how they that's how they could actually convey their true feelings without you know being ridiculed or you know or or talking about it in a way that wasn't socially acceptable at the yeah. time. And I think there's so much to that. And I, I bet you identify with that too. So I am an Englishman who was sent to boarding school when I was seven years old, when I effectively said goodbye to my parents when I was seven years old. And I didn't see them again properly until I've always joked until I was famous. Um, uh, I, yeah, it's a kind of environment where uh, emotions were not discussed or talked about or, or genuinely, if I'm honest, needed. We, I didn't, you know, we didn't need yeah. emotion. It was a tough environment. I was in all boys' school, um, and uh, and people have described me afterwards. My mother would say emotionally stunted in my way. And if I go down to a pub with my friends or a bar with you, I have no need to discuss emotion and how I feel with my best friends in the world, my closest closest friends yeah. in the world. I do not discuss. The, you know, how I feel inside, what it is that makes me tick. And these are talking about, you know, age old, lifelong friends. I, that just doesn't occur to me to discuss. I do not need that. But of course, we still have emotion. And of course, we still need to express emotion in some way or find an outlet. And for me, I found music is just uh, the way I can capture how I feel and, and convey how I feel. You were um, seven years old when your parents sent you to Harrow, which is a obviously, a, you know, if you know the sort of the public schools, what we would call boarding schools in the U.S., a very prestigious school. But you were there, God, it, it probably was in the early 80s. And I imagine it was, it could have, at the time, could be a cruel place. Yeah. Um, so we have a system, exactly. Seven years sent to a prep school, um, which you have a headmaster who really becomes your father. 
um, and you yeah. have a, a, a deputy headmaster who becomes your mother. He, in our case, he was a man, but you know he becomes the the, the care, more caring figure. Um, and uh, and so yeah, that they, as you say, to have two two people who are your your parental figures is What's a that? Thing. I mean, you know, I I I'm thinking of you as a 14, 15, 16 year old kid um, at you know way at school. Um, but you grew up. I mean, you come from a family uh, of generations of military men. Your father was a colonel. He was a high ranking officer in the British Army. Um, and was it expected of you also to serve? It wasn't expected of me, but it was right. something my father introduced me to because it's something he understood and knew and and could potentially uh, open doors in the way of saying, you know, hey, you know, James, this is what I know and this is what you could potentially do. He couldn't introduce me to anyone in the music business. No, he didn't know anyone in the music business, but he could say, hey, look, this is the job that I do and you know, this is the path um, you could follow if you want to. And he was very clear that it was something I could follow if I wanted, not a force. Well, let, me, let me ask you about music because I know that you, you, know, you sort of played the violin as a little kid. That was something that your mom, from what I understand, made you do. I made my kids do that too. They didn't last that long. But, but you, um, I, I guess even you know, while you were at boarding school, you were playing guitar. You were writing songs. Yeah, definitely. My mother was very good. I, ha I have to give her the credit. My mother, you know, made me take up violin when I was young. I, I did, what we learned from that, I'm mean, not entirely sure. We were just playing hot cross buns around, going anti-clockwise round a hot cross <laughs> bun, and maybe involved in a satanic ritual, which would make sense because it was the 70s. Um, but beyond that, the piano she she gave me, you know, paid for piano lessons for me. I didn't enjoy them. I was doing Mozart sonata and F sharp minor. It's not a great song to play to your mates. But it was giving me a musical background so that when I did reach an age where I had my own sense of individuality, 14 or so, and I did have uh, things to say that I wanted to say um, and struggling in boarding school with an outlet to say it, I could then pick up music and say, I want to learn the guitar, um, write songs and, uh, and suddenly saw a path for myself. So, it's, you know, I'm, and even I'm a young I'm a father of young children now, and, and I do yeah. think to myself, you know, it was a great gift she gave me by making me take those lessons, no matter how much I enjoyed or didn't enjoy them. When you were a, because we're, we're pretty much the same age, and so I, and I lived in Britain for many years as a student in college, and I, I wonder when you were at Harrow playing the guitar and singing songs, were you ridiculed by your fellow students, or was it, was it okay, was it cool enough? And not as much as I'm ridiculed now. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the when I started saying, age 14, 15, I'm going to be a, a rock star, I'm going to be a pop star. Yeah, you said that, you would say that. Yes, um, I wanted to be a rock star. I ended up being a pop star instead. But, uh, but yeah, I was saying very clearly, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a musician and I, you know, be a pop star. That's what, I, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and would you perform, by the way, in front of your classmates like like on talent shows and stuff um yeah i would you know I'd, uh, there's not much of an outlet for it in those kind of environment but they'd have the house music competition and you know and then then one house would produce um a, a bunch of guys you know with a kind of orchestral quartet who'd play something on the violin and uh, violins and a cello and i would turn up and i'd be in charge of my house uh you know that's because these schools are broken up into houses that you sleep in dorm houses I'd turn up with my electric guitar, with my mate on bagpipes and my other friend on drums, doing some kind of mashup. Um, and you could see, okay, you know, whatever I'm trying to do is not going to win the house music competition, but it's certainly got some imagination. Um, I guess you did what, what would be the equivalent of an ROTC scholarship when you went to college in the US. You basically go to college as a reserve officer, and then you commit to serving in the military for four or six years exactly. after. And you did the, the, the version of that in the UK, um, went to University of Bristol, essentially as a reserve officer, um, knowing that after you graduated, you would spend at least four years in the military. Um, as I mentioned, your, your dad, I think your grandfather, great-grandfather, all, all military men um, and officers. Yeah. Um, did you imagine when you got when you started at you know at Sandhurst and you started to train as an officer that you would maybe pursue the career like your dad who was a, a you know a career officer? 
Um, I had always held the ambition still to be a musician. I still knew I was going to hmm. do that. Um, but also when you're very young, then time is not of concern to you so much. So yeah. I owed the army four years because they paid for my education. Um, I ended up doing six years because I because I, I had some good jobs within the military, and I um, and all of it, I suppose, was also you know an education in the world and an inspiration as a musician. You can't just go into music if you've got nothing to write about. Um, and yeah. so at least I was living a life, seeing the world, and coming back with things to say about um, what I'd seen. Um, so, and also at that stage, as I say, I was young enough not to feel a sense of time pressure. I wonder what was worse, um, life at Harrow or life at Sandhurst? Uh, what was harder? Yeah, Sandhurst is, is hard. It's supposed to be hard. Mm. It's supposed to pull you out of being a young man or, or woman who's at a school or university. And it's supposed to make you self-reliant um, and a leader. Uh, and so I'd come from university when university is amazing. Having gone from boarding school and uh, just live, it's living with men, and bo boys rather, then suddenly I'm at university and I'm mixing with you know, girls, and we're, we don't have parental control or teacher control, and we're free. University is just the best time of your life. And suddenly, yeah. I'm at Sandhurst, where as we arrived and uh, dropped off by my father, and he left, these sergeants, color sergeants, uh, um, and, and so on, start screaming at you, left, right, left, right, left, right, and off you're marched. Um, and then you find yourself given a room, but rather than sleeping on your bed, you have to iron your bed into place, measure the fold of your bed mm. with a Bible, then sleep on the floor beside your very, very beautiful, beautifully made bed. And you can't even close the curtains because you've uh, folded them, pleated them and, and uh, onto the windowsill and they're open there. So you're on the floor, curtains open and your cupboards are immaculate and you're being treated like a prisoner. Um, in many ways, and you're, as you say, not only sleeping on the floor in your bedroom, but out on exercise through whales, um, and, and, you know, again, being screamed out. You're living it. It's a tough experience, and it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me that you finished university in Bristol in 1996, which means that you were living in Bristol in sort of a golden age of music. I mean, it was like the trip hop, Portishead, Massive Attack, Tricky. It was amazing. I think all... All or some of them, for sure, were from that area and performing in that area. Did that music speak to you? Definitely. I've never been. I've never written or recorded music as as as, as well as kind of magical, I suppose, as theirs. Um, there's something slightly otherworldly, slightly left field of the music that, that all of those guys you've mentioned. But whether was I inspired and listened to it? Absolutely. Um, and and whenever I was doing little gigs in little bars in Bristol. Those were the names that people were uh, that were on everybody's lips. All right, so you are in um, at Sandhurst um, and beginning a life as a as an officer. But but back to music. I mean, you were a guy with a guitar, a singer songwriter. Who are you? Who who are you listening to? What I mean, even even just as a student um, in in at San at Harrow or in, at Bristol or now in you know at Sandhurst, were you listening to singer songwriters? I had a different ambition. I wanted to be a rock star. I learned the electric right. guitar. I met, uh, I, you know, I, I met with my friends because they were in different schools. You know, we, we're out of school, we would we would go back to where I lived in the countryside. Um, and so you'd be with those friends for your holidays, but then return to a school, so you'd have you know different school friends. Um, at that stage, I had an electric guitar and an amplifier, and I would get on you know a train with my amp you know on you know on a skateboard. I'd strapped it to a skateboard, um, and the whole thing is a palaver really to try and you know get yourself and your equipment to go and find your friends to form this band to have you know a, a short period of time to rehearse and. and terrible gigs playing for, you know, boys or girls schools nearby. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and that was an ambition. And as a dream, uh, I think it changed over the years. I just found eventually I'm going to pick up an acoustic guitar instead. And so, so yeah. once upon a time, I was listening to, the, you know, Led Zeppelin. That's who I wanted to be. Um, and the, and yeah. the most musical and the gentle would be Fleetwood Mac, but you know, really, it was kind of rock bands, um, American guitar bands, um, American guitar solos was what I learnt. You know, and when I first picked up the electric guitar, that's what I was telling my dad I was going to be, and he was there going, you know, do you, do you, any reason you really can't do it on an acoustic guitar instead? Uh, 
And in the end, he was right, simply because I just found that lugging the electric guitar and its amplifier around just too tricky. I mean, when you were coming of age, the bands that were having a global impact in that there was a window of time were from Britain. It was Blur, Oasis, Radiohead, but, you know, obviously they would go on to have even more significant impact, but like Pulp, Elastica, that whole what's called the Britpop scene. Did that speak to you? Did you... Or, or were you really kind of attracted to American rock and roll from the 70s uh, and 80s? To, um, yeah, the thing I was into was definitely American American guitar bands as a thing. But then as I, as I went on, as I say, you know, just literally it was a physical thing of being bored by lugging an amplifier strapped to a skateboard onto, tra- onto train stations and, you know, and never any lifts. Eventually, I found an acoustic guitar traveled better. Um, and, uh, you know, and so picking up an acoustic guitar, it just starts to make you write in a particular way. Um, an electric guitar makes you write in a different way. And so I wrote songs on an acoustic guitar as my, as my workhorse. Um, and and that, that created the kind of songs that I was writing. And when you thought about, you, know, you mentioned Led Zeppelin and, you know, um, guitar bands, obviously they're not an American band, but when, when you were... Yeah, I mean, I would say them, the list I would say was like, you know, Guns and Roses, John Bon Jovi, okay. um, Poison uh, by Alice Cooper as a, you know, as a song was like, you know, that was, that's when yeah. you first, uh, you know, I rem- and as I mentioned as a song, the first time I heard Poison, I, I can remember where I was, you know, literally wow. like, that was a moment thinking this sounds awesome. Um you know, the, that was just very, those, that kind of sound was very exciting to me. I'd do something completely different. What, because I don't think Poison really penetrated the UK, right? Like maybe Guns N' Roses did because they were huge. But what was it about there? Because I have never interviewed anybody. Who, and, that, and this is no, no shade. I've just never interviewed anybody who was like, Poison influenced me. I'm really interested to, to kind of hear more about that. Like what was it about that Yeah, sound? but it was a sound of that time. You know, what else can I think of? Yeah, Final Countdown by Europe. I mean, what a, you know, what a, mm. what a, they're just insanely bold sounds. And and now we can kind of look yeah. back and that we can sort of sneer slightly at them now going, it's too much, it's too cliche, it's too ridiculous. But there was, there's such an ambition with the sound, there's such a confidence with the sound. Yeah. You know, the, all the bands you've mentioned, the UK bands of, of, pulp and blur isn't there a pretension with some of the stuff that you know with the way they deliver isn't there an image that there's an image whereas there you know whereas the, the there was an innocence of the american gu- guitar band just uh, an excitement and innocence with the way it was presented you felt like it's interesting because you felt like those bands that i mentioned were trying to be clever and but the but the thing that you liked about poison or europe or guns and roses was they were just trying to make rock music yeah it was a you know, there's a dream. They just are. They're dre- they're dreamers and they're dreaming big. And they're and, and there's something rather wonderful about that. As you say, they're not trying to be clever with it. Um, instead, yeah. there's an honesty. And although my music doesn't equate to what they do, I certainly am trying to pursue honesty. I'm not trying to be cool. Yeah. Um, I could never achieve that. I'm not trying to. I don't project an image. Um, I don't, and I, I say it as a quote. I don't sing songs about my fast car or my expensive watch. I just, and I don't, and I don't write songs for the cool gang either. But most people on this planet aren't cool. Most people are dealing with real life, of you know, of what it is yeah. to to pay bills, to ha- deal with their kids, to be in relationships that have highs and lows, to be concerned about their own happiness and the happiness of those around us. Those are the things I write about. None of that's cool. So when do you, I mean, you're still in the military, right? And in the army and you would deploy, you actually deployed to Kosovo. Um, and I was there as a reporter as well. So I know Kosovo, well, I did know Kosovo very well at, at a time. Um, and this was the first, as, as you know, I mean, this is the first NATO engagement ever, right? Um, significant engagement um, in Serbia, Kosovo. Um, and... You know, you. I think you, you. You've told a story before, which is an amazing story, where you were part of, you know, this this squadron of thirty thousand. Um, squadron is probably not the right word. Is it? Was it? Yeah. Well, the 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 entire um, organization of NATO that was sent out there were thirty thousand of uh, uh, of us in total. Yeah. Um, and I was broken down to a squadron of uh, of about a um, hundred people. 
um, that was a, a and you were you were you were the lead in that squadron, right? So I was, well, yeah, no. Well, I tell you what, I, I was a reconnaissance officer. Reconnaissance, I meaning I was the eyes right. and the ears of my commanders. I'd go out and look, um, look and listen to what's going on. And in, in, in the bombing campaign, uh, I was, and you know, I'd assist with calling an aircraft. Um, a fast air would come in, but they'd need directing. So we'd need to, you know, give them, find them targets, um, and then they they would deal with those targets. Uh, so then, after this bombing campaign, and then a peace accord, um, we then uh, then thirty thousand of us went into Kosovo itself. We pushed in, pushed the Serb army back, and at that stage, I was the lead person. Um, I was got, you know, I was the front man. So not in charge, but in charge of at least getting this there and directing thirty thousand people, which is quite a lot of pressure because if you've got thirty thousand people following and you take a right when you should have taken a left to tell thirty thousand people to turn around would be embarrassing. So it's a it's a certain pressure. My job was to get us then to Pristina, the capital of Kosovo, and uh, and ultimately to try and beat the Russians there so that we had control of the airport. There was a point where you were on the outskirts of the airport and there were about two or three hundred Russian soldiers at the Pristina airport. Um, and you actually got on a call with General Wesley Clark, who I think was the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO at the time, in charge of this mission. And he gave you essentially an order to do something that you were not comfortable with. What what happened? Well, it started on the journey there. We were pushing up with this, you know, as I say, with this enormous column of NATO troops following me. And there I was, you know, leading leading the way down a road, being told you've got to beat the Russians because we knew the Russians were coming in. They'd snuck in from, I think, from Bosnia. And they were being, you know, waved in by the, by the Serb army. We were being hindered by the Serb army. They were um, mining uh, areas. They were um, putting explosives in tunnels. And we were trying to get through these um, mined areas whilst under time pressure. And on the journey there, knowing that the Russians were on the way, I was already being given an order from um, from my superiors, who, and it came from the top, from General Wesley Clark, saying, get there, and if they beat us there, overrun them and overpower them. At the first time I heard it, I just wrote the order down. I didn't really think very much about it. Overrun and overpower. And off we pushed. Um, we reached, as you say, these obstacles. We 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 dealt with them in in different ways. You know, telling my soldiers we're going to go across a minefield. Them saying, "Okay, sir, no problem." I'd say to the first vehicle, "When you, you know, when he explode, when he gets blown up, the third vehicle's going to overtake and he'll lead." So you know, you're just rolling in this ridiculous kind of way, and all the soldiers are going understood. Off we pushed, and we made it to the airport. But the Russians had got there first. And there we were, standing in a Mexican standoff, 200 Russians and us, 30,000 of us, you know, behind me and all of us, you know, I've got a, I'm in a small tank. This is going to be, as far as a soldier goes, this is, almost, this is almost fun as far as, 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 far as odds go. Um, uh, and, and then, the, you know, the order came, instru- uh, the instruction came again from Wesley Clark, overrun and overpower them. At that stage, you start thinking a little bit more seriously about your order. And it's not a word a wording that we would use. Our, our doctrine doesn't use that. We would normally say, you know, engage with your enemy, um, destroy the enemy, but overrun and overpower. Well, you know, if I overpowered you right now, if we were in the same room and overpowered you, does that mean hold you down and tickle you? You know, <laughs> um, it, what does that mean exactly? And it felt that the words were being used, um, uh, you know, in unclearly for a reason potentially. Not that I yeah. thought that so that much at that moment. What I really felt was that this is easy, but are there not consequences of killing two hundred Russians? So how did you how did you manage to get out of the situation? Well, I was just asking the question a, a lot. I'd go up at the chain of command on my radio, saying, you know, I, I you know I don't think I understand the instruction. It's it, it seems unclear to me. And have we understood the consequences of the instruction as well? And I need I need higher power to consider the impact of these instructions which we were you know we got 30 minutes ago on our way here but now we're here are you for real are you sure have you thought about it um you know i know i'm just a junior officer at that stage but uh, but i'm not stupid enough to understand that there are large consequences in the action that we're just about to uh, instigate um as this process was going on, as I'm questioning these instructions, and uh, a general called Mike Jackson, General Mike Jackson, um, he, he confronted 
Wesley Clark and, uh, and broadcast on the radio. No, I will not have my soldiers be responsible for starting World War III. And we were instructed instead to pull back uh, out of this intense moment, surround the airport. Um, and after two days, the Russians said, excuse me, we don't have any food, any water. Um, could we potentially have some of yours, share some of yours? And, and the, uh, the offer came back to them. Sure, you can have food and water. We can share ours if you share the airport. And, and with that, World War III was averted. Um, at that stage, I'd already pushed on. Actually, I'd pushed up to the, the borders now, then with Serbia, because um, you know the job obviously doesn't stop there. But it was an amazing, probably the most amazing day of my life. Yeah. Wow. So you um, you had another you know two and a half years um, serving um, as an officer, and you left in in October of two thousand two after six years. Really, at this point now, determined to pursue a career. As a as a singer songwriter, but when did you make the transition from like okay, at that point had you made the transition from I want to be a rock and roller like do a Guns and Roses Poison band to I want to be a singer songwriter like had you made that transition in your mind at that point? Yeah, I had. By then, I was doing small concerts in bars and clubs in London. Um, my final two years in the army after Kosovo, they asked me what I wanted to do. I, I amazingly got the gig as the, the Queen's ceremonial bodyguard in London. So if you go to Buckingham Palace, you'll see this, you know, the guards outside there and you'll see the horse guards wandering past um, uh, down to close to Downing Street in a place called Horse Guards. I got that job which is, you know, a, a ridiculous and fantastic um, thing to have. You wore the whole costume and the outfit? Yeah, so I was in a helmet, plume, uh, uh, you know, a breastplate, armor, sword, um, on a horse, you know, boots up to your thighs, really. You must be in thousands of, of like, like picture books and, and yeah, photo albums around the world. Yeah, I mean, annoyingly, you can't even work out if it's yourself because, <laughs> because yeah. you know, the only thing you got to look at is your nose and <laughs> lip sticking out of the top of it. Uh, it was an amazing job to have, but but the, it gave me an opportunity to do concerts in London at night. And I was so I was getting up at six every morning, riding horses out, uh, marches with the Queen beside her in, in her carriage, and then at night I'd go and do these small concerts. And at that stage, yes, I'm on an acoustic guitar and I'm writing and I'm sorry and I'm performing the songs. I had written, um, which are me, yeah, me, me do singing, singing, you know, acoustic and emotional songs. I'm just curious, did you ever, I mean, uh, given your position, like, did, were there ever moments where you spoke to the Queen or were you just, you know, or she spoke to you guys or was it? Yeah, very much. She was um, a, a very engaged boss. Uh, she was, uh, you know, duty full duty bound um and very professional um her eye for detail was really astute you know she 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 was the she was the and leader she knew she was, your name like she 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 called you captain blunt or whatever was that your rank exactly that yeah um exactly you know we were the people who you know at the end of the day we we're her bodyguards and protectors uh, although i'm in a ceremonial yeah. um scenario we've trained to protect her in that environment. So, you know, we would go out and have a carriage ridden along an old runway with, a, you know, a, a, one of us, a friend of mine would always say, I'll be the queen. I'll sit in the queen in the carriage. And we would have people dressed in, you know, helmets, you know, sort of uh, army helmets and body armor trying to attack her. And we would use the horses and ourselves to defend her in any in number of scenarios. But I'm mic'd up to the police um, and they can, you know, and they can hear me. I can speak to them and, and so we can communicate. And so it's a proper defensive job. I mean, it's kind of amazing because like f within the next four years, you would become an international megastar, which we're going to talk about in a second. But just, just going back to this moment, did did you ever... You must have met the queen in other capacities after you became famous, and she must have been like, well, little did I know, you were just, you know, on a horse guarding me a few years ago, and here you are now. Well, she's very well briefed. And so the first time uh, I met after leaving the army, I was playing um, at uh, some event. I think, it, you know, it was a polo event, terribly uh, embarrassing to say, uh, uh, a polo event. I've been asked to play when I was just uh, getting there in the music business. I'd hit big that week. I was number one, and uh, and sure enough, she was there, and I was invited to meet her. And as I was in the kind of you know the queue to meet her, I suppose of you know of eight people that were going to be presented to Her Majesty, um, you know someone naturally here saying you know there's one of your 
old old guard here and she said yeah i can tell it's the scruffy one because <laughs> by that stage i was long-haired and bearded and wearing jeans um and and she you know and she said yeah i, I can recognize and and i think the inference was haven't i let myself go i mean you must be the only guard like queen's guard that ever had that turn of career like right i think most of those guys probably continue on in the military and then maybe get corporate jobs or jobs and you know as security consultants right i mean you must be the only one i think on the whole yes um i mean my own regiment i think tommy uh T tommy cooper was in my regiment you know obviously a long time before me you know you have i guess the question really is do you have diverse people within the military um, and yeah. and that is a, yes we do you know some of our greatest poets have been in the army at different stages um, have there right. been but that was during during the time of yep. of of the draft where people were drafted right yes exactly but you know but there there have there have been along the way and you know the army is full of of people with different different skills and different talents oh, definitely yeah. but at that stage of my life and that stage of you know at that time that you're talking about yeah sure I was the only one going into music that also gave me an advantage because. I had a dream to go into the music business. No one could tell me that I couldn't achieve that. Uh, and also, I didn't have anyone to keep compete with. I just had this na naive belief I could do it. Had I known then what I know now, I don't think I would have necessarily um, gone into it because I would have been afraid by how many thousands of people have that dream. When I got a record deal and moved to Los Angeles, everyone there is trying to be a musician. Everyone's trying to be a musician and an actor. And yeah. suddenly you go, wow, this is harder than I expected because there are a ton of people doing the same thing. And tell me a little bit about how your musical style began to emerge as you, as you really leaned into being a solo singer-songwriter. I mean, who were you starting to listen to or, or what, were there any acts that you started to kind of or artists that you started to just listen to? I, I don't think I've really necessarily been overly influenced by other people. I think my musical knowledge is not necessarily, you know, that encyclopedic. Um, and I say, you know, the great singer-songwriters of the 70s, from Elton John, um, uh, Paul Simon, I do think, you know, obviously these guys are, uh, are genii in their way, aren't they? And, um, you know, and as I say, Fleetwood Mac, I could say as a band, but I don't know if these are people that I was influenced by necessarily. What I really felt is I was just trying to capture and convey how I felt on the inside. And that doesn't take much musical influence. It just takes honesty of expression. Um, at university, uh, in my dissertation, I, I, uh, I wrote about... My, my dissertation is called Commodification of Image, Production of a Pop Idol. I was talking about the music business as a whole and how it's really forming and creating images and perception and selling it to people, commercializing it. And I felt I was trying to do something very different. I was really trying to be as honest and as raw as I can. Later in life, I, there's, I felt a little kickback from, from how open and earnest and serious I have been in my songwriting. But really, without any notion of what it is to be cool, I was just trying to convey how I felt. And I can, I can explain that with my biggest hit, You're Beautiful, which is, if you want to say to someone who you really, really, really adore that is the light of your life and the one, how are you going to tell her that? And for me, I, can, yeah. I sat in a bath, <laughs> having seen that girl on a, on a subway, and just wanted to say, you're beautiful. And the way it comes out of me is just the way I sing it. You're beautiful. It just turns into those notes. It doesn't take an education or a lesson. There's no magic behind it. It's just expressing how you feel. You, presumably, you wrote that song many years before it was released, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, and and from what I gather, it, you wrote it very quickly. Yeah, it wasn't like months and months of draft and draft. It was it just kind of came out in I don't know an afternoon. Very much, I passed my ex girlfriend on the underground in London. We uh, underground doesn't roll off the tongue quite so easily as subway. So in the lyrics, and I use the word subway. Uh, yes, and she uh, she was walking past with her new boyfriend, who I didn't know existed. She and I caught eyes, lived a lifetime in that second, didn't do anything about it. I went back to the army barracks that I was uh, living in, in Hyde Park barracks, um, jumped in a bath and, you know, wrote those, those words and they just came in a flash. And that really, on, that's, on the whole, is the best way of songwriting. It's just saying how you feel without thought, without consideration. You, very soon after you got out of the army, you signed... A deal with EMI. How did that happen? I mean, that's obviously, you know, 
hard yeah. to do. How did you get in there? I uh, was doing these concerts in London, little you know gigs uh, in bars and clubs gigs, yeah. to 50 people sometimes uh, at best and five people at worst. And those five people would be my friends, um, you know. And uh, and along the way, I was then inviting record deals, record labels rather, down to the concert. And uh, and you know, sure enough, they might come along. They, they will send someone to check out who who's new and who's playing. And I would be saying, you know, here's my song, and I, you better sign me up, or else my mother's gonna kill you. Um, and and uh, after a while, some people, you know, I'd m you know meet who were in the business would say, hey James, you're approaching this in the wrong way. You know, the the last thing you want to do now is go to a record label because you get one shot with a record label, and they need to see. Yeah. They, they, on the whole, I love my label, but on the whole, in that scenario, they don't ha don't have much of an imagination. They don't, you know, want to nurture something. They want to be gifted something. So you need to come with everything, all the tools. You need to come with, you know, the voice and the songs and the vision from where, for, for which direction you're going to go in. You can't, I would say, you know, I could be anyone. I can be anything you want me to be, and they don't want that. They want to say, this is who I am. Uh, and yeah. so at some stage, someone said, don't approach record labels. Get yourself a manager. More than anything, get yourself the right manager. And so then in the next two or three gigs, not many, I started inviting management firms down. And um, very soon, one of the first ones was a guy called Todd Interland. Um, he called me. He'd been and he was he'd been Elton John's manager, right? He'd been Elton John's day to day manager. So you know you normally have right. two managers. One is your kind of career manager, and the other's managing you day to day, taking you to um, you know TV stations, radio shows, and uh, I'm doing the harder graft. And he was Elton John's day to day manager, but he called me. He was in his car. Um, he had just heard uh, my demo CD, and, he, and it had a number written on it. And he said, "You know, I'd love to meet you." We met, and I think "Goodbye, My Lover" was exactly on that. Demo, that. Right? Uh, and how did he get the demo? By the way, how did you get that? How did you even get that in front of him? Well, I was passing it around to literally everyone and anyone, and uh, and you know, I, embarrassingly now, you know, twenty years later, I still bump into people saying, "Yeah, I've got your demo a CD," because <laughs> there are a ton <laughs> passed out. You know, at that stage, all you're just trying to do is get them out to everyone and anyone. It's a time yeah. where you could copy tapes, you could copy CDs, and you know, and I was having friends passing it out. Um, it got to him, it had my phone number on, and we met. And you know, and, I, and you know, I, I. It's a funny thing in life, isn't it? Sometimes when you meet someone, you just know in your gut um, that this person's a good person who's gonna who's gonna be my yeah. you know my friend, my advocate, my supporter. Um, that man is still my manager. Um, it's yeah, amazing. And, and, I, and, and I always say, when anyone asks me now, what should I do to get into the music business? I say, a manager. That's what you need. Find somebody. Yeah. Um, you you eventually signed. Um, uh, with a label with Linda Perry, who's actually from, from here, from where I'm speaking to you, San Francisco, famously um, lead singer for Non Blondes. She founded her own label and you s signed with that label. I mean, it's it was a brand new label. Uh, nobody had heard of it. It's called Custard Records. Kind of a risky move, right? Well, no, for me, it was, it was uh, the only offer. At that stage, right. I, didn't, I didn't even understand how desperate it was because I had blown my load with some record labels already at these shows. Then with Todd, we did get a, he, you know, he said, let's go and speak to a publisher, EMI Music, as you're talking about. So we got a publishing deal for me as a songwriter. Um, not for your own recording, just to write songs. Not for my own recording, but they, they knew what I was trying to do, but to, you know, to sign for the songwriter of, uh, 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 side of things. And they also know that if they can get in early, it'll get me some financial support, uh, give me some financial support, and that you know, if I can get a record deal beyond, then they'll, then, you know, they'll be laughing. They know what, they know what they're doing. Um, uh, and so they, they're sort of investing early. That investment gave me the chance to do more gigs, hiring a couple of musicians to play with me. But we approached every single label in the UK and got an offer from one. That was Virgin Records, hmm. but maybe other, you know, 50, 60 other record labels said no. When I approached that label, Virgin, who gave me the record deal, they first said to me, um, you know, you're amazing, you're going to be a star, we love you. We walked in for, to sign the paperwork with Todd, with the senior manager, Elton's senior manager, Derek McKillop, a Scotsman, and they sat me down and said, we really love what you do. Every one of them introduced themselves in the job. I'm, I'm the head of the label, I'm the head of A&R, I'm the head of marketing, all of them, and you're going to be a star. And then the head of marketing said, we do have a little problem with your speaking voice because in England 
I have an accent, um, and uh, it's an accent, a, an accent that's considered to be posh. Yes, which uh, which is again, it goes into that bracket of not cool. Um, and they said, "Can you do a different accent?" And I said, "Sure, I can. Um, I could do Pakistani." But they want you to sound like Noel Gallagher. I mean, <laughs> I think that was the idea, um, which I couldn't pull off. I said, "No, I can't. I could, I could do Pakistani as an accent. I could try and pull that off one." And uh, uh, and my my Scottish. Uh, Manager then stood up with his Scottish accent himself. So let's let's get the hell out of here, um, and and off we wandered. Uh, and so you couldn't get a deal with a British label because you were perceived to be like not edgy enough and not because you had you were you know you went you were educated. Yeah, and there's a thing. It was even though even though Damon Alburn from. Blur and they're playing. They've gone to, you know, they're, they're, they're all yes, they university. Will, exactly. You know, there's a thing, isn't there? The the working class hero is um is a thing, and I get that. And you know, and 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 I don't sing songs that are relevant to that either. You know, I don't sing about the, the how tough I've had of a background because I haven't. I've been very fortunate. You know, as I say, my dad in the army. Um, you know, I can I can sing about being nomadic potentially. Um, but but certainly not having a tough a tough time um hmm. and so yeah so that's the thing in the uk and we have a little bit of a chip on our shoulders about it uh they couldn't they felt like they couldn't market you i mean i'm just thinking like coldplay was out there and they were all university graduates yeah now i don't know how it played out exactly with coldplay to begin with but i suspect if you follow they didn't do very many interviews to begin with um huh. and if you hear the accents that the, with which they speak you know i, I you kind of go okay have has something been toned down here or not i don't really know and it's a question for them as to whether they found it it's also easier i think as a band um than an individual because it's very much uh, defined by the personality yeah. and you know in england traditionally we've had an issue with this lots of public school people have got into it but how we how we how we get through it has been a thing and for me i would just perhaps worse at hiding it and so i came to america so this and i yeah. got yeah so this was your only option so this label. well what happened is then I, I flew out to south by southwest the music festival in austin texas yeah. um i flew out with two musicians who i was paying for with my publishing deal money um speaking to them recently because i've, I've just you know written a book and i was just going through life they said to me you know you, you didn't really understand that we just thought this is the last last chance saloon. You know, we had, you know, it's huh. gone, oh, every every opportunity, this was it. You're not, you know, it's, and then I turned up, flown all these thousands of miles and we arrived and rather than being kind of in the hub of this festival, I was actually on the outskirts of Austin playing um, uh, in a Ramada hotel on the 20th floor of this Ramada hotel to an audience of about 20 people, which was pretty disheartening. Um, but at the end of this concert, this woman walked up with such character, um, you know, hat and hair and leathers on. And she said, my name is Linda. I've got a record label called Custard Records. She didn't tell me it was the only signing. I was only going to be the first signing on it. Um, but I want to sign you now. If, I, if you sign um, now, I'll give you, you know, this much money to make your album tomorrow. And I said, hell yes. Wow. Amazing. All right. So you go to L.A., and this is, I, I don't know all the details of this story, but it's just, the story gets even weirder, or maybe weird is not the right word, but just more sort of out fantastical. You live with the actor Carrie Fisher while you're recording the album. Yeah. Can you can you explain how that happened? I mean, it it's so funny now thinking about it, because at the time I had a dream um, that I'd leave the army, get a record deal, you know, um, become a rock star. And and so when you bump into Carrie Fisher in a restaurant in London, you know, who friends, she's friends of the, uh, of a family I knew, of a, gir a girl I'd been seeing, and, and they invited me to this lunch, and I'm sitting next to Carrie. I didn't know act actresses or actors or musicians really that well, but here I am sitting next to her. You knew Star Wars, though. I knew Star Wars, absolutely. Not a, not yeah. a mega, f not a, you know, not obsessed by it, but certainly, uh, you know, I certainly I knew it, um, and she was there beside me. She asked me, "What are you gonna? What do you do? What do you do? Who are you? And what do you do?" Really, was the question. I said, "You know, I'm James. Just left the army. Got a record deal. Moving to Los Angeles to record my first album." Second question she asked was, "Where are you gonna live?" And I said, "I don't know. I haven't sorted that out yet." And her third statement to me was, well, "Then you're gonna live with me," and you know, wow. a, a, an amazing place to live. And I suppose, uh, gosh, I, I I'm. I'm 
my naivety at that stage was warranted because, you know, here I am, I leave... I leave the army. I've got Elton John's junior manager as my manager. I've been signed by Linda Perry in the States. I'm, I'm, and I'm living with Carrie Fisher. You know, you think life is, whatever dream it is, it's going to work. You, you know, there's no doubt in your mind at this stage, things are going to work for me. Um, and it was an amazing opportunity. I'm very, very lucky to have lived there with her. She's an incredible human being, an incredibly creative human being. In her house, I wish I could really show you a photograph now, but there were chandeliers in the garden from the hanging from the trees. Um, There'd be a telephone box, you know, a British telephone, red telephone box in the garden standing there. Um, there'd be a Christmas tree, 365 days a year. There were literally objects and trinkets everywhere that you looked that were just an extension of, of the madness and creativity of this m amazing woman's mind. On the property also lived her mother, Debbie Reynolds, who's the actress from Singing in the Rain, who would shout sure. at me every morning, hey, Charlie, you want a drink? Then I'd go, I'm here, and I'm not Charlie, I'm James. Uh, you sure you're not Charlie? I'm sure. You want to drink anyway? Uh, uh, and It's like a movie. I mean, it's like, well, there was a movie about her life, Postcards yeah, on the Edge. Yeah, exactly. And so, and uh, every day I'd go out to the studio and every day I'd come back and, you know, I'd come back at about 11 o'clock at night. I never really spoke to her uh, for the first month. Um, I just would get out, go to the studio and work, and work and then come back and, you know, and go into my cabin. I was in cabin number one. In cabin number two was living a, a man called Charlie Wessler, who was a producer of Dumb and Dumber and There's Something About Mary. He'd lived with the dog from There's Something About Mary that you see in the movie. You know, so all of us, you're just kind of in the thick of uh, Hollywood, really. This was in Beverly Hills? In Beverly Hills, exactly. So she just had a compound with different little sort of houses. Yeah, the two, bu the two bungalows, exactly, for Charlie and myself, her mum on the property too. And how long were you there? Well, for the first, um, for that first stint, I was there for probably five months, four and a half, five months. Um, but then I would just, you know, that was my home in America. Um, I'm signed to a, you know, a, a, to Linda's record label based in California, based in Los Angeles. So when I come and write, record, that's my home. And she was, you know, just it was an open yeah. door, and that's, you know, that's where I lived. And it was, it was a home to me. And she was my landlady and my American mother. So tell me about writing. I mean, were the, the, the a lot of the songs that were, would end up on Back to Bedlam were on that demo CD that you sent to a bunch of people, right? Or did you? So did you have the whole record fully baked in your mind when you went out to L.A.? Um, to begin with, I suppose I had about half an album. Uh, but then signing the deal, uh, now with a publisher, now we've got to make a full album. And at that stage, I'm, I'm working with lots of different and interesting people trying to find a producer to, to make it all make sense. But writing songs avidly at that stage. How did you find... Um Collaborators? Did Linda Perry connect you with songwriters? No, I don't think she did. But more production. She was she was interested in how the album was going to be made. Um, but I, but yeah, I really had lots of ideas um, from from different areas of my life, and I was tr recording demos uh, uh, early on with a guy called Sasha Scarbeck um, and a guy called Jimmy Hogarth. They're not necessarily names you'll know, but you'll probably know where they've ended up. You know, for me, Sasha Scarbeck is a name at uh, Wrecking Ball. He, he's a writer on that. But at that, wow. but at wow. that stage, he, he wasn't on the scene. You know, I was, he and I were writing. So what actually was, I had these ideas. I had all these ideas. Uh, I'd, I'd come out of the army with a ton of different things. And I was trying to record demos, and these guys were trying to make it in the music business themselves. But they were musicians who had really solid musical knowledge. So whereas I would write a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, then maybe another verse, he'd stop me and say, hey, okay, that idea you've played me, there's a thing called a middle eight where we turn the chords around here and, we, uh, and, you, tr and you mess with the melody there and it just, it'll make your song feel more complete. I didn't know what he was mm. talking about at the time. You know, no one had given me this education, but these guys were giving me a musical education um, th about the actual notion of, you know, song craft. Um, and at that stage then, I was, that was how I took these basic raw ideas of a guy with emotion and took it into finessed songs um, that are the end product that, that made Back to Bedlam. And so I, I, those two names, you know, and he went on, as I say, to be one of the writers of Wrecking Ball. But at the time, you know, but wow. at the time he was probably just a very good keyboard player with, you know, with great, great musical knowledge who was my teacher in, in many ways. Um, James, obviously the, the, the record industry and has changed so much in the era of TikTok and social media and Spotify, but... In 2004, when Back to Bedlam came out, you were on a still... I mean, Linda Perry obviously had a, a few massive hits. Uh, what's going on or what's up? I think that was the name of the song. Obviously, 
was her biggest hit. So she had some influence and she was a well-known producer, but the label was still small. How did you get, how do you remember when that record was released, getting the attention of program directors at radio stations to even bother listening to it? Because they were getting, you know, 50 CDs a week. Well, we recorded back to Bedlam. That wasn't without its difficulty in the first place. Uh, you know, I, I, I found my producer, Tom Rothrock, um, who is an amazing human being. He did Beck, Elliot Smith, Badly Drawn Boy, and the Foo Fighters. Really cool people. Wow. Um, and, uh, and as he points out quite rightly, um, he, the cool people stopped calling him after he'd produced me. Uh, but, uh, but he, for me, was this most magical human being and, and a very close friend of mine. You know, I kind of turned up, spoke to him about the dream, and then he got his out his finger and pressed record, pressed the red button and said, so what are you going to do? And at that, at that stage, it was a weird moment. You kind of think, hang on, you're, you're the producer here. You're supposed to just do everything. But, but instead, yeah. and, you know, and of course, he gives guidance and sets the scenario. But really, he just sets up the environment for you to make um, the music and draw from you. And, you know, sure, he brought in some fantastic musicians a long way. But all of it was really just dragging out of me and out of them the music that we f were feeling um, on this record. And, and there's a real genius to, to how he works that made Back to Bedlam not sound like Tom Rothrock. Um, and 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 that's a, a special quality. You know, there are so many famous producers out there who you go, oh, that's that record. You can hear it's... That's Brian Eno. Exactly. Or that's uh, yeah, Nigel... But, but there's uh, no Calvary. album, yeah. I don't think, that you could say, oh, I can hear that as a Tom Rothrock album because his invisibility is, is his genius because he can really pull from you what it is you're trying to say. Um, and uh, and it's uh, yeah, and I and I I feel I owe him a huge amount in my life um, for the way he worked, and we recorded that, and then along the way I'm signed to this independent record label, but that's not going to get you heard. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. you're on this label at Custard Records that nobody's ever heard of. It doesn't have the same clout in any way. And so Linda started licensing it out to different people, and she licensed it to a major record label who went under. Um, and from the ashes of that record label. So at this stage, you're thinking my career is, you know, it's starting and it's stopping. Uh, done, and it's done. Finished. And we've spent the money. Yeah. And then Atlantic Records was reborn and they, and from the ashes of the, another two other labels, um, they, they, they formed and started. They had a number of different artists and labels who they kind of bought in the, in this kind of um, moment and they got rid of 70 and they kept seven. Um, seven acts and I turned around to Todd my manager and said well presumably they're keeping me aren't they because we've just made a record and he went James you know they've spent hmm. pennies on yours yours is, a, is a, the smallest write off they can feasibly imagine this is nothing you mean they, they acquired it for but nothing yes basically um, and uh, and yeah and any cash write off that we spent on it is, is you know is a small tax write off uh, yeah. and, and yeah and I, which something I just hadn't really understood and then, uh, and then anyway, Atlantic Records, they'd chosen six artists. Of the seven, then, we had a kind of gig off, a fight between me and another artist. We had to play a gig in the same venue where the record label came down and listened to both of us. Who was it? Can you tell me? His name is David Kitt. Um, and it was a tough gig for me because he had a band and he was more established, so he was going to be the lead artist and I was the support act. It was a tough moment because he didn't actually let me... He said I was going to be able to use his sound man, but when I turned up, he didn't. Um, uh, and, uh, and they didn't... And by the way, this competition or this audition was to see which artist Atlantic was going to put their marketing muscle behind? Exactly that. Who was going to effectively get the, yeah, who's going to get the record deal with Atlantic and release their album. Um, and and so I understand why he was being tough on me, this guy. You know, we were both fighting for the same deal. So he didn't get, I yeah. wasn't given a sound check. I wasn't allowed to use his sound man. I stood on that stage. I had a keyboard player. Um, uh, and I brought my sister along to do backing vocals. And what did you sing? Um, you know, most of the songs you know on Back to Bedlam because I'd recorded it. Mm -hmm. I'd recorded that album and it yeah. existed. So there's You're Beautiful and Goodbye My Lover. They were on that, you know, they were part of that performance. But also the way that that man spoke to, you know, the, the way I wasn't given a sound man, the way I wasn't given a sound check. And at that stage, I realized, okay, I'm going to get on this stage. I'm going to sing my little heart out. Um, and I sung for the record deal, wow. and, and I got the record deal. And I, I'm, in many ways, I probably have him to be grateful for. Um, because what happened to him? I, I'm well, trying you to know, he's released albums, and and also, you know, what what else would he do? He was just doing what anyone would do. We're fighting for a record deal, and it's it's to the death because it's our dream. 
Um, and it, had it gone any other way, he and I would be say, we'd just be saying the same story the other way around. Um, I remember when, when Your Beautiful came out, I was overseas, and it was a global phenomenon. Um, and you were the first British artist in, in over a decade, I think solo artist, to, to top the U.S. charts, which is very hard because the United States can be less so today, but certainly in 2006, more provincial. And most countries Definitely, are, right, in terms of who they listen to. In the, in the U.K., it's Brits. And in the U.S., it's Americans. Um, but you, you managed to hit number one Billboard shirts. That, that song, that record took off. What, how, I mean, did Atlantic, was it, I mean, again, they're great songs and obviously catchy songs, but that's not always enough, right? It, you, it, you have to get those songs in front of program directors. You've got to get them to be willing to play it. Did Atlantic really put its muscle behind that to make that happen? We spoke about it beforehand and came up with a plan and it made sense to me in that normally you release an album and you count first week sales and how, how big the first week sales are kind of, that's how well your album's done. If you've hit whatever place yeah. in the chart, but I didn't know anyone who might buy my album. And so I'd say to my record label bosses, why are you going to count first week sales when I, I, I don't know, I don't know a thousand people who are going to get this album. I, at that stage, you know, it's not being played much on the radio. How am I, if you count the first week, I'm, I'm kind of doomed from the get go. So can't we count right. second week sales instead? If I can sell a hundred albums the first week and then a hundred people tell their friends and you sell 250 the next week, then we can see, you know, uh, then you can see there's growth and development. That would be more exciting. If it can yeah. grow from 250 to 1,000 in week three, then surely that's consequent weeks are more interesting if we can work that way. And so they said, okay, what we'll do is we'll do a soft release. To me, that was exciting. Maybe to them, they were just hedging their bets. This is in 2005. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and so we released a song called High, and it got me some radio play. And that was that was what we were after. It felt we felt we all felt good, and then we released a song called Wise Men. This is all in the UK, really, and Europe, I suppose. And that yeah. song Wise Men got um, into the charts more than at radio play. Got into the charts, and it got my album into the top twenty. So now we're all feeling good. And then we dropped a song called You're Beautiful, and I knew that it was this was the, my big shot. Now you know we've done these other songs. I love the other songs, and I you know I still believe that High was going to be bigger than 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 You're Beautiful. But but you know I knew that You're Beautiful yeah. was now going to be. This is the third single. This is the third shot. This is it, and it sure was it. It did its thing. Yeah, I mean, it became a, a huge hit around the world. Did you? Um, and all of a sudden. Um, you became very famous, right? You've gone from being an obscure captain in, in the British Army to, you know, in a short period of time, like performing on live television and Saturday Night Live and going on Oprah and, and, and the Grammys. Amazing. You know, um, the Brit Awards. How did you personally handle that? Were you, were you, because, I wonder if because you were in the army, you were equipped to deal with that stress that you actually could manage that level of stress? I think probably better equipped than the young people who start in the music business. Um, yeah. You know, most people, when they get into the business, are, are very young, fresh out of school, some of them younger. Um, I don't know how old, you know, the Kelly Clarkson's of the world, uh, pulling out any name out of her hat. I think she started very, very young. The Michael Jackson's of the world. Yeah. I mean, you know, so many of these people from uh, American Idol, you know, these are kids, really. And suddenly they're exposed um, to fame and, you know, and known to a nation or the world. And very, very young. And I was, I'd left the army when... 32. I, yeah, I was, yeah, exactly. 28 when I left the army. As you say, probably about 32 when I hit. Definitely yeah. better equipped because it is crazy. The world goes absolutely yeah. crazy. And people have often asked me, does fame change you? No, it changes everybody else. Because you walk down a street or into a bar and everyone starts nudging each other and pointing to you, uh, asking for an autograph or a photograph. Um, and, and they all start acting in a crazy way to, to you know, what is just a, a normal human being. And of course, you then change and adapt to that. But it's a, it's a bizarre experience. Some of it is fantastic, you know. I yeah. loved it. I still do. There are elements of it which are every, you know, which are every school child's dream. Um, from when I first was in Los Angeles recording music 
And when I was going out, um, I'd have to, you know, beg and borrow to get in. I was going through the fire escape of a fire club, you know, a, a nightclub rather. To get into a nightclub, I'd climb the fire escape and get in, get someone who's already in, mm -hmm. call them, and they'd squeeze you in through there. Um, suddenly, you're being swept in uh, to a nightclub. You're being given a table. There are people just fighting, literally fighting to be on the table with you. Um, you you know, your uh, alcohol served uh, willingly and uh, and... And every party and every opportunity is there. And uh, and if you're shallow and fickle enough to enjoy it, which I really am, it's a, a great, great fun experience. And I had a blast. Does it come with some baggage? Definitely, yes. Um, it, can it? Can you lose your mind and lose your way with that? Definitely, yes. And have I at the, along the way? Yeah, I have. And you know, and we relay stories to each other now as a band and friends, and go, yeah, you know, yeah, would would, would I behave that way now? Would I, yeah, as a as a as a more grown up human being. Um, would I do that the yeah. same way? No, I would necessarily hope not to. But was it fun? Yeah, definitely was. Um, I want to ask you, talk to you a little bit about the backlash. I, I, many years ago, I interviewed the writer Ken Follett, you know, probably one of the best-selling living writers in the world. And Ken Follett is a very intelligent guy, but um, you know, he's not considered in the same way by critics as like, you know, much more obscure writers who maybe their prose style is, um, you know, a. a Again, more sophisticated, or they're more more allegorical, or whatever it might be. But he, I remember, I interviewed him. He said, "Look, I may not be the most acclaimed writer by critics, but I'm certainly the richest writer." And he said it sort of, you know, tongue in cheek. But the point he was making was, he writes for a mass audience, you know. And I wonder if, if you know, you, you earlier you kind of alluded to this idea that you write. You're not trying to be clever. You're not. I mean, obviously, you're an intelligent guy, but you're not trying to show people how intelligent you are. You're just, you're writing words that are simple, straightforward, and that are meaningful to you and probably will be to other people. Exactly. Um, you know, it, it was a quirk for me at the beginning because I was signed to an independent label. I was working with an indie producer. Um, uh, you know, as yeah. I say, the, the artists that we work with are, are uber cool. And, and the album itself, when it was first presented, that first album, Back to Bedlam, it certainly wasn't considered mainstream. But then this song hit, and rather than just the mainstream, it was right in the middle, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and ubiquitous, and and you know, and and it took me right into this road of right, there you are, commercial, you know, almost middle of the road, <laughs> is the title you go yeah. for it, and um, with all that, with all the insult that that might infer, um. And and I joke about that now, you know, there I am in the middle of the road, having a backlash from critics from the safety of the sidewalk, um, uh, you know, saying, and you go hang, you know, yeah, it was a, it has massive, massive commercial success. And then there's a, a sneer that comes with that. People sneer at that yeah. commercial, that level of commercial success. But what do you want? What do you want in life? Do you want to be, you know, cool and unheard of yeah. or... or or um or heard of and and I'm very lucky that I you know I played around the world and have a big audience and uh and I'm and I'm kind of yeah. pleased. It's a funny thing because I'm made to feel bad for it in some way, but actually, how would you want it? I kind of I'm, I should be quite I could be I'm quite happy with it. You know, it's interesting because I mean, your that record sold 11.2 million copies. I think it's a best-selling record in the UK in the 2000s, um, and. I've interviewed on this show, you know, we've had all kinds of musicians, um, but there are some musicians who have had massive success, commercial success, like uh, Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20 or Gavin Rossdale of Bush. And similarly, there was a backlash. You know, they're not cool enough. They're, you know, how come they're so successful? And I wonder whether the the, the massive success of that song also played into the backlash, right? That Because you were never... I don't know. I mean, you, you, you've said it yourself. You weren't part of the cool kids crowd in the UK. Yeah, and I, I never expected to be, in, and nor could I be. Um, I suppose you know, a, a notion of backlash caught me by surprise. Do you think, hang on, it's just a song. It's just a musician, and why, why do you feel? Yeah. Why is there the, the need to feel aggressive to it? The aggression people are expressing is because it's so visible, so ubiquitous, and so commercially successful. Um, and uh, and. And there's a sneer, isn't there, that comes with it that, 
you know, oh, everybody loves Coldplay, um, therefore Coldplay aren't cool. And you go, well, you know, actually, Coldplay are really, really good. Um, uh, yeah. And so it, it does happen in something like music when it comes to taste and what people say, my, my taste is better than your taste. You have no taste. I have better taste yeah. than you. Um, and... Yeah, it's a thing that we deal with, that we deal with, have to think about. But at the end of the day, yeah, I just, it's something I can't compete with and neither should I have to worry about it. I mean, on the one hand, I guess looking at it from 35,000 feet, uh, you know, most people would say, well, who cares? You sold 11.2 million records. Like, you're more successful commercially than virtually all of your peers. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think all all creative people the work that they do, you you know, it's it's always when your peers recognize you that it means the most. And I wonder if some of that pushback or backlash from critics and even some of your peers stung. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and uh, and yet there's little one can do about it, or little I can do about it. Uh, and also there's a, to a level I can sort of understand, you know, I'm, I know sometimes I, I pursue commercial success. Sometimes I write songs to try and get on radio and, and then those songs are released by my label as my radio singles. And I listen back and I go, you know, it's, it's not my best work. Um, because it, it, you know, it's just trying to sound like other stuff on the radio. And if we're honest, lots of the stuff on radio sounds pretty terrible. Um, but I'll pursue that. And then after the event go, damn it, I wish I'd just stuck to what I know I do best. Then along the way, I can point to some songs, whether they're acclaimed or not by, um, you know, those in my, in my business or not, some songs I can point to and go, yeah, I'm proud of that as a song. Those are songs that I've been honest about, yeah. honest with myself and not pursued commercial success are the ones I am most proud of. James, I, I, I'm curious to ask you about your approach to songwriting. Um, before we began this interview, I was telling you about a book, a forthcoming book, about the relationship between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And, and essentially what this writer um, you know, presents as, as the main thesis of the book is that the music they were writing was a chance for them to really express their emotions and feelings because they grew up at a time, certainly in the UK, even around the world, where it wasn't acceptable for men to talk about their emotions, their sadness, their their hurt, their pain. Um, so much of what John Lennon and Paul McCartney wrote about in their careers were connected to the fact that both their mothers died young um, and, um, and the pain of their childhoods and love lost and complicated emotions. Um, and I wonder if, if, obviously, you're writing your work many years later, where it's a little bit easier for men to talk about these things openly, but still not so easy. Yeah. Did Do you use and have you used your songs as a vehicle to talk about how what's inside of you, like what you can't just that's say? All, that's all, all I use it for. It's uh, I, I'm not one to get into a conversation where there's a danger of confrontation with someone I'm, I care for or love, be it my parents, my siblings or my wife um uh I it's could, just natural you don't like yeah, confrontation I, because you know what if i get into confrontation i'm going to push it till i win um and, and that's not always yeah. the best answer uh because you because you might be wrong or there might be a cost to force something that way um and so i find i can go away and i could write a letter um, and that gives you time. A letter gives you time to process the words. But I can write that into a, a, a short poem, which I can put to melody, and then you have a song. Um, and it means you've taken the time to make sure you say it in exactly the right way, um, uh, to bear their situation in mind and express how you feel. Um, and and, and there's a, it gives you a little bit of leeway as well when you put it to music too. But I think what you talked about with the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and about expression of emotion in a time that is a struggle. I relate to that in many ways. I'm, a, as I say, hmm. this boarding school boy, joined the army, British, in a business where people normally try and, try and convey how they might be, their perception of who they are as big, strong men with a lot of money. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and I do the opposite. I sing about my fears, my failings, my frailties. Uh, are you big and brave standing up in amongst a band of people 
as your support men uh, telling people how wonderful you are? Or is there something braver to standing on a stage on your own and effectively removing your clothes, your shell, your pretensions, and telling people, as naked as it might be, who mm. who you really are, what is in your soul, with the things you don't like about yourself and are afraid of, and whilst it's as I say, it, it's it, it doesn't get many accolades within the music business or my, or my peers, my audience certainly has yeah. said, "Hey James, those are the words that I needed to hear. Those are the words that I connect to and relate to. Those are the the, the words that most people." Um, living ordinary uh, lives with ordinary simple emotions, um, everyday emotions, uh, connect to, and 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 that's my been my greatest reward. Might got not got an accolade from others, but the connection I have with my, with my audience and the stories they relay back to me, um, relevant to the words that I've sung to them, is my greatest reward. Um, so, would you describe yourself as a sort of caricature, stiff upper Definitely. lip? Brit or my wife would yeah. say I'm totally emotionally stunted. I'm known as an, uh, <laughs> in the music business as uh, that guy, that romantic guy, you know, who sings those romantic songs. Um, uh, and uh, my wife would tell you I'm uh, totally unromantic. And there's a clue in the song, you're beautiful. It's, you know, guys high on drugs talking to someone else's girlfriend. Um, uh, I'm, uh, that, yeah, a classic, classic British upper, uh, stiff upper lip. I'm an emotionless human being. But Music has given me an outlet in 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 your in your in your interactions, but essentially, what what if I'm reading between the lines, where you find your ability to really bring out your creativity is by mining those emotions that you can't quite express to people. Exactly, and I think probably um, because I'm mining them um, and find you know they 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 come with a, a great intensity and probably an unexpected intensity. As well, from the you know, from those uh, closest to me, at least, um, to yeah, to suddenly capture exactly what it is that that you wouldn't expect someone like me to be saying. I suppose, in many ways, that's also you know, women, girls have said they often don't expect a man to have said that <laughs> to express yeah. themselves in that way. You've got a new record out. Your seventh album came out in um, twenty twenty three. Who we used to be. Um, Obviously, your life is different than when you were a young guy, you know, single guy writing songs about love lost and, um, you know, the, 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 the experiences you have are different as a parent and as a husband. And also, um, you know, you're a, you're, your sort of lifestyle is different, right? And I wonder how you find or where you find those moments of inspiration, those areas to to really drive your creativity. Where do you where do you look? I'm find I find myself in an age of great inspiration. Um in the same way that I did when I was a teenager, leaving school potentially, um, finding my own sense of individuality as a young man, the questions I had of who I might be and meet and where I would end up. Um, that, that, that's the biggest shift change uh, in our lives from, from you know, child to young adult. Um, and so, so much inspiration then. At my age, maybe your age too, our place again is changing. My parents are getting old. And rather than them being the heads of the family, I now need to think about my place potentially looking after them, stepping into their shoes to look after them, um, uh, in, rather than them look after me. I now don't write songs about just myself and my concerns. There's not me at the center. I'm not afraid for myself anymore. I'm afraid for my children instead. So I write songs for them. Um, the questions I had as a child have been answered. I've met that, the woman of my dreams and live with her. And I write songs not about a girl I pass in the subway for a second, but instead for someone who's chosen potentially, if she's foolish enough to, to live out the rest of our days together. So the songs I write her aren't just, hey, you know, it's you, I'm going to live with you, but they're a bigger statement than you're beautiful. They're, um, they're a grander statement saying, you know, oh my God, this is the person. Uh, for the rest of my life and that's you know and the miracle of finding that on a planet that is uh with many billions of people on it um on this record you wrote a song about um you know your wife's 
unfortunate miscarriage, and I'm sorry to hear about that. I experienced that myself many years ago. Um, and earlier, you wrote a song about Carrie Fisher and her death, because um, I know that was um, sort of a, a difficult thing for you, uh, understandably. But I think you saw her shortly before she died, and it and and from what I gather, it was too difficult for you to go to her funeral. You you decided that it was you couldn't get through it. Yes, uh, I was with her the day before she died. Um, she came around to see um, me and my family. She's godmother to my eldest. And, um, and you know, she'd been going through a time where she'd been not necessarily looking after herself particularly well. But she'd also been living yeah. the, uh, living the uh, her successes again, of being back in the new Star Wars movies. So it was an exciting time. But scary also to see the pressures that she was under. And we said goodbye, and she got on a plane, and she died. Um, and and at that time, you know, having seen the, the damage that she was doing to herself, and uh, uh, it was it, it was confusing to see the the fallout from that. Um, her, her her closer family um, battled slightly with each other. The way the funeral was presented, I I felt slightly uncomfortable with the way. The house that I'd lived in with her was uh, was dealt with. That they they there were conflictions over how they how they dealt with that as a as a close family. And Carrie thought that would happen anyway. She had to say to me that she expected that to happen. So anyway, so when I was asked to go to the funeral, I didn't. Um, and uh, and then I went back to Los Angeles. Um, I was not staying in her house anymore. Obviously, I was staying in a hotel down the road. And I um and then I I drove up the hill to go and say goodbye to feel a bit of her feel a bit of her to see if I could. And I drove up the hill just to say goodbye. I put my, yeah, and all I found was a for sale sign, effectively put my hand on the gate and there's tears in my eyes. And these are the lyrics that I wrote of the song. I just told a story of going back to her house and all that was left since the minute she died, who died with the chandeliers and the trees, ceramic bees and all, and they're now they're just covered in leaves, you know. So it had taken me a long time to write the song because I wanted the words I wanted to say to her. And that's, it had been an education as a songwriter. The word, if you think too hard about the words, uh, try and think what it is that you want to make them feel. Uh, it, it's never honest. But then, if you just describe something, describe it as what you did and how and how you feel, will come your honesty again. And yeah, she died in two thousand and sixteen. But it took me until this year to to write uh, that song. Dark thought. Dark thought is the song. When you um when you think about, you know, maybe maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about you and and what you've done is um you have a really healthy perspective on your success i mean and on and on people who may not like your work may not like your music um to 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 the extent to which you engage with people on social media sometimes like people will say mean things and and your response is to kind of be funny and self-deprecating um is that um, which I think is amazing, and and I can't imagine it's easy. But I don't know. Is that is that? Have you found that to be the most constructive way to deal with it? Yeah, it came as a surprise the uh, the aggression with which some people would say that they hate my music or hate me. And if you're in a band, it's easier because they just say they hate the name of a band, Coldplay again. You know, I hate Coldplay. Uh, it's going to hurt you professionally, but not personally. Whereas. If you're a solo artist, they don't say the name of your band; they say your actual name, um, and, and so that gives yeah. it. You know, it's 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 it can dig more, but then after enough of it, you start to process it um, and put it in perspective. And so, as you say, you know, I'm lucky enough to have had the biggest LMA album of the noughties in the UK, and people are. Uh, and so, some people liked it. <laughs> um, some yeah. people liked it. Some people say they didn't. That's music. That's if you know if you're a chef, you're going to have to deal with the same thing. Some are going to like some food, and some are going to you know not like it. You're just going to have to deal with that and get over it. Um, and I'm really lucky that millions have gone out and bought the album, um, and tens of thousands are turning up to my concerts. Um, and so I can be affected by the negativity, or I can put it in perspective and say, actually, lots of people like it. I'm really, really lucky. And it's interesting in interviews. I'll be sitting outside inside an arena um, with. Literally, you know, thousands of people queuing up to come inside in the rain and they've bought tickets for good money, hard-earned money. They've traveled there by car or plane or train. And I'll be asked, how do you deal with all this negativity? And you go, 
hang on, but there are <laughs> thousands of people outside. Yeah. You know, are, are yeah. we looking, we're looking the wrong way and asking the wrong questions sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it is human nature to be, uh, to ask that, to be, notice the negativity, to be affected by that. And so really when social media came along and I was supposed to use it to sell my wares, instead I found it was a great chance to, to, to answer back. But at the same time, yeah. I am answering back to the negativity that I've been laughing at myself, uh, you know, laughing at other people for talking to me about. And so I, I found myself just, yeah, finding it as an outlet to laugh, not at just the person abusing me, but to laugh at myself yeah. for even spending the time to read it. And it's given me a healthy perspective. When you think about um, the rest of your career, you've got seven studio albums, and I have to imagine you've got many more in you. What do you imagine? I mean, is this what you want to be doing until you drop dead, you know, <laughs> writing records, making music, and maybe occasionally touring? Yeah, it is. I love it. I have an amazing time. I mean, you know, life is life is very short, and uh, as we get to it, that, you know, at a certain age, you start to realize um, that that it's gone quick. And uh, and do I only want to do this? No, I don't. Um, uh, there are other things in my in my life that I want to fill it with. Yes, I've got I've bought a pub um, because you know, if you're a minor pop star in the world, you should own a pub. Uh, <laughs> There's a pub in no, a, I have in a pub Ibiza, in right? London actually called oh, Fox and Pheasant, hundred and seventy year old okay. pub, and you know. Um, and uh, and it gives me something else to think about and something else to do. And if you're in London and you said, hey, James, what should we do? I'd say, Guy, I own a pub. Uh, <laughs> let's go there. And these are healthy things to, to do. Um, yeah. And you and as I say, you know, I've just written a book because there are stories to be told and, and it's a different mental exercise in there. Do I have aspirations to play, you know, bigger and better places? Definitely. You know, I play arenas uh, around the world other than potentially in the States where I'm playing theatres. Um, you know, it, it, the ambition there is to still to play a, a bigger place and, uh, and do that definitely. But as jobs go, would I change it? No, I'm having a blast. Yeah. Amazing. Um, James Blunt, thank you so much. Guy, thank you so much indeed. I really do appreciate your thought and uh, time. Thanks for watching my conversation with singer-songwriter James Blunt. His new album is called Who We Used To Be. You can find out more about James and get links to some of his music at thegreatcreators.com slash blunt. And if you want to see all of our conversations and interviews with dozens of actors and musicians, check out our website, thegreatcreators.com or subscribe to this channel.